Last lecture focused on encoding and how we get the information into the brain and beyond that how we can also use certain tricks and methods to improve getting the information in effectively. Today's lecture is really going to focus on storage or how we retain that information. So if you look back at what we talked about last time, if you remember we had these three main types of memory that we discussed and they each get stored at different levels. So we have the sensory memory, which is the first stage of the information coming in through your senses. And then that moves over into the working memory, which if you recall last time I, I compared that to a computer monitor. It's sort of like all the space you have to work with with, uh, with certain concepts at one time. And then the long-term memory, which is more like your hard drive, which is where the information is stored for potential use later on. So what we see is that the information goes in, it gets encoded, stays in the working memory for a little bit, moves over to the long-term memory, and then when we need it, we retrieve it, and it goes from the working memory and comes out in whatever format we use the information. So this is the basic way in which memory operates. So we're going to break it down into the sensory memory. So what we see with sensory memory is that uh, we have limited recall for certain amounts of information. So Sperling did a study where he flashed this image on the left for 1 20th of a second. So a very brief period of time that he flashed this information. And what he saw was that when asked to recall the information, only about 44% success. So the exposure time for the stimulus is relatively small and therefore the information can't be rehearsed. So it's staying in the sensory memory, spends a very brief period of time in working memory, but it doesn't get fully integrated. Now if you change things a little bit and you do what's known as a partial report, what we see is that Sperling was able to find that if you phrase the question in such a way you actually improve that recall. So what Sperling did was he flashed this image again on the left for about 1 20th of a second. That was followed immediately by a specific tone. Now the participants were told prior to the experiment that a low tone meant they needed to recall the information from the top line. The medium tone meant that they needed to recall from the middle line and the high tone from the bottom line. And what we see is presentation followed immediately by the specific tone results in 100% recall. So what this means is that our sensory memory is actually pretty impressive. It's just that it doesn't last very long. Now to test how long it lasts, Sperling did another study where he examined the impact of a time delay. So he flashes the card on the left for 1 20th of a second again. We're using the same time here because we want to make sure that the time uh, that the presentation occurs doesn't impact the outcome. So flashes the card on the left for 1 20th of a second and then has a brief time delay. Immediately following the time delay, the tone is played again. And what we see is that those individuals were only able to recall typically about one of the three letters, or 33% recall. So what we see is that while we have a relatively large capacity for sensory memory, the duration is not very long and is heavily impacted by the time delay between when the information is sensed through your senses and when it's utilized, or when you're asked to recall it. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the longer the delay results in the greater memory loss. So we're not even talking a full second here. We're not saying he flashed the card and then waited five minutes before he hit the tone. Nothing like that. We're talking less than a second. So what we see is that down here, this is one second, only about 30% of the information is recalled, whereas if it's only uh, you know, 0.15 or 15% of a second, we see about 80% recognition. 
So time delay really has a pretty profound impact on your ability to remember sensory information. But we have different types of sensory information. The three different types are iconic, echoic, and hepatic. So basically what we see is that each of these are based off of three primary senses. Your eyesight, which is iconic, your hearing, which is echoic, and your sense of touch, which is hepatic. And what we see, and I talked about this last time a little bit uh, very briefly, is that hearing has the longest duration of any of our sensory memories, at roughly three to four seconds long. So this is in large part why we see that uh, if someone says something to you, and you say, wait a minute, could you repeat that? And then as they're saying it, or even slightly before they say it, you're like, oh yeah, that's what they said, never mind, they don't need to repeat it. Well, that's because echoic memory is so much longer than iconic or hepatic memory. It enables you to retain that information for a significantly longer period of time and recall it and use it. So iconic is half a second, hepatic is a little bit less than a second, and echoic lasts a full three to four seconds long. So that's your sensory memory, and that's how we get, that's the first level of getting that information in. So after the information gets in through the senses, working memory and long-term memory are really the parts that we're talking about when it comes to storage. So working memory is that computer monitor that determines how much space you have. So let's look at working memory a little bit more in depth. Working memory is another way of looking at short-term memory. And we've really been examining this uh, for a significantly long time because uh, this goes all the way back to uh, you know, Sir George Hamilton, which basically realized that he could toss something on the ground, and if it was seven or less, he could generally determine the amount relatively quickly. In addition, he could remember seven plus or minus two very accurately. If there were more beans than seven, then he had a bit of difficulty recognizing how many were there. Uh, there are plenty of hypotheses being thrown around about how this may be part of how animals perform rudimentary forms of counting. If any of you have ever lived on a farm before, you might have had, um, you know, some sort of birds, whether it's chickens or ducks, uh, that, you know, not only know, uh, you know, how many chicks they have, but can identify when one is missing. Well, one of the hypotheses here is that if it's seven plus or minus two, these uh, ducks or geese or chickens are able to recognize it relatively easily without actually having to count. Um, so the idea of seven plus or minus two is not necessarily specific to humans. It certainly isn't the case for all species, but many species have a limited capacity of about seven plus or minus two for their working memory. Because you have to remember, learning is what enables survival, and memory is a key component of learning. So as easy as it would be to believe that only humans are capable of long-term and short-term memory, this is simply not true. And anybody that has a pet would know that this is the case. Animals remember shit. They just do. And this is because it's evolutionarily benef beneficial. So one way to examine the capacity is to do a little experiment. So the magical number of seven plus or minus two uh, was examined through a number of experiments. One of the ways they did that was by doing something along this line. If I were to present a certain amount of information for a very brief period of time, see how much you can recall. No writing down, just take a moment, glance at it, and then when I press the next button, see if you can see how much you can remember. So I flashed that for about five seconds, and most of you should be able to recall about seven plus or minus two letters. Uh, if you organize the information into chunks, you can probably recall significantly more. The duration of working memory can be manipulated by rehearsal. So generally speaking, working memory lasts about 20 seconds. 
Now, if you have something that inhibits your ability to rehearse the information, then it's not going to stay in your working memory, and it's going to be far more difficult. So, in this image that we have here, the participant is listening to these words, or these nonsense strings of syllables, rather, um, and then after that, they have to recite and count backwards from 547 by threes. So 547, 544, 541. And then they're asked to recall the information. And what we see is that when they are not allowed to rehearse the information, they have much poorer recall. So if you've ever wondered why when your mind is filled with uh, all sorts of conflicts, questions, or problems, and you're reading, or even if you're just bored and you're reading and you're preoccupied about something else, this is part of why the information doesn't get into your long-term storage, is because you're putting something else in front of what you're reading. So while you're reading the information, it's getting into your sensory memory, it's not moving into the short term, which means it's never going to move into the long term. So it just sits in your working memory for less than 20 seconds because you're not able to practice it, and it goes right out. So this is part of why it's really beneficial to focus on one thing at a time. You know, uh, one of the interesting things about productivity, everybody uh, loves to talk about how great they are at multitasking. Well, the fact of the matter is that multitasking is actually really a bad practice, in large part because of this phenomenon. When you multitask, you are putting multiple things in conflict with, your, um, with other things, and so your working memory gets stretched, and it can't handle doing more than one task at once. So it's actually better to focus on one task at a time and complete it before moving on to another. So here's just a graph to display what I showed earlier with those individuals. Um, so what we had was the, uh, the, the nonsense string of letters, right? And they had to uh, do something that didn't allow them to rehearse. In that instance, it was counting backwards by threes. What we see is that when you stop them after three seconds, they have about 60% recall. Not bad. Um, but double that to six, and bam, only 30% recall. Make them wait a whopping 18 seconds, and they can only remember less than 5% of the information. So, working memory duration was largely determined by this information, by looking at how long the information could remain. So, we've looked at sensory memory and how the information initially comes into the working memory, which remember the working memory is like your desktop. Now, the long-term memory is where it gets really interesting. The long-term memory is essentially your hard drive, but it's not a 500 gigabyte hard drive. It's not a terabyte hard drive. No, it can hold unlimited amounts. The brain is capable of holding unlimited information, or at least more information than we're capable of using. Estimates of capacity range from between 100 or 1,000 billion to 1 million billion bits of information. And again, this is not specific to humans. Many species have this same range of long-term memory capability. In fact, many birds are capable of locating food at 6,000 different locations from sheer memory. That's more than, I, I couldn't even, I don't know if I could remember 6,000 locations from my own sheer memory. But it's less important to my survival. It's necessary for their survival. So the information that we store in our long-term memory is largely dependent on whether or not it's important to us. So birds tend to store information about the location of food, travel patterns, and songs. Those are the primary components of their memories. They certainly have other memories, for instance, predators. That's probably another of their core ones. But other things like, um, you know, whether or not a human is friendly. That information is less important and less likely to be retained long term. So this is a chart to look at the different types of memory and how long they last and the different capacities. So sensory memory is essentially pulling the information out. 
Um, it's a very low level of encoding. It has unlimited capacity, however. We can pull in a lot of sensory information. Now, not all of that is going to go to working memory. In fact, most of it's not going to go to working memory. Now, I'm able to sense pretty much everything that's going on around me. However, unless it's relevant, I'm not going to zero in on it and move it to working memory. A perfect example of how really powerful sensory memory is when it comes to how unlimited it is, is when you're sitting in a room, and the room can be very, very loud, you can have a lot of noise going on, and you could be focused on reading something. But if someone says your name, even if they're not speaking to you, you'll automatically pick up on it because you have unlimited capacity. You may not be able to hear any of the other conversations because none of them are relevant, but your name is always relevant, and that really gives you an example of how huge your capacity is for sensory memory. However, while the capacity is huge, the duration is very short. We're talking a quarter of a second here. Uh, remember, the different types of sensory memory have different durations. This is an average. So remember that the echoic memory, which is your hearing, that one can last three to four seconds. Iconic memory, that one's going to be the shortest. We're looking at about a quarter of a second there. And hepatic memory, which is that sensation of touch, that one's less than a second. Working memory gives us about seven plus or minus two chunks. So if you remember last lecture, I spoke about chunking and how you can improve your working memory by chunking information. Uh, this is how you're going to get more information on your desktop at a specific amount of time, is by chunking the information. Working memory doesn't last very long, though. It lasts about 20 seconds. Now, it makes it sound like it, it doesn't have a lot, you know, you, you can't do a lot with your working memory. Well, that's not really true because what you're doing with the duration of working memory is, sure, it's only there for 20 seconds, but then it kind of gets pulled back out again. And you keep pulling in the information. And so you continually combine the information while it's in your working memory. Working memory is where you do all your problem solving and, and all of your real thinking. Uh, you don't do any thinking in the long-term memory because that's where the storage is. That's your hard drive. Now, you can't really do much while it's on your hard drive unless you pull it up onto your desktop. But the long-term memory has very large, almost unlimited capacity. It's the deepest level of memory because it's one that remains with you for years and years and years. Um, a perfect example is early childhood memories. You know, I know, uh, this, is, this is ridiculous, uh, I was seven years old. <clears throat> and we were doing this, uh, I don't know, it, it was like, we, we practiced for like a week, and it was this little dance. It was a tribal African dance. Uh, it's supposed to have swords, but obviously we're seven, so it's poles. And we're like dancing between two poles that are being lifted up and clapped together. Um, I remember this dance very well. It was called Teninkling. Um, cracks me up to say, called Teninkling. And um, I have absolutely no use for this memory. I still remember the song. If I were to hear the song again, I would know that that's the Teninkling song. But that's sort of how we can see that it's, it's huge capacity, and the number of years that it stays within your memory is... I mean, I will probably remember that for the rest of my life. Now, the fact of the matter is that I will remember it better because I rehearse it, because I think about it every now and again. So when you rehearse the information, it's going to stay for a longer period of time, and it's going to be more solid in your memory. However, you can continue to reform memories by thinking about them and trying to remember them. But that gets really sticky because oftentimes you can create aspects of memory that weren't really there. Um, I'm probably, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and I'll post a really interesting link to Elizabeth Loftus, and she talks a lot about how you can actually create memories. So that'll be a fun little video for you to watch as well if you're interested. It's, it's really fascinating. She did a study where she uh, implanted the memory of almost being kidnapped in the minds of many adults. Um, and it was very effective. They had you know, strong memories of remembering people in flannel, and, and it, it was all made up. So long-term memory can be sticky, um, and it's not perfect, 
but you have a very large capacity for your long-term memory and it lasts for years. Yeah, I'm going to skip over this. These are some important things. Pause it if you want and read it. They're interesting. I'm going to skip over it. <coughs> so, the way that memories continue to be formed is through a process known as long-term potentiation. <clears throat> so, if you remember back at the neuron lecture, we were talking about how communication occurs between neurons at the synapse. So what we've got right here, right, we've got the axon terminal, and that's the terminal button, and down here is the dendrite. And you can see right here that's the synaptic gap right between the two neurons, and that's where the neurotransmitters transfer from one neuron to the next. Now, all of these neurons are linked, and the more that they communicate, the stronger the links between the two are. Now, what information is stored in a neuron? That's a really sticky issue that we don't quite know the answer to yet. We do know that certain neurons act in certain ways, and one of my favorite examples is the Halle Berry neuron. <clears throat> now, this is an individual that was involved in a study where they were electrically stimulating specific neurons within the brain. And then they were also saying things um, and seeing how the neuron activated. And there was an individual in the study who had what they called the Halle Berry neuron. When stimulated, this neuron <clears throat> brought images and thoughts about Halle Berry to that participant's mind. So when the neuron was excited, all he could think about was Halle Berry. If they said the word holly, the neuron didn't activate. If they said the word berries, the neuron still didn't activate. But when they said Halle Berry, the neuron activated. Now, Halle also activated the neuron, but holly, which is a very similar name, did not activate that neuron. So one hypothesis is that a specific bit of information is stored within each neuron. But we know that that can't quite be true, because for the most part, uh, you're not generating new neurons on a very, very regular basis. And yet you still draw in new information. So the most information is actually stored within these synapses, within the communication between these two. And the more often that two neurons communicate, the stronger that bond becomes. So this process is called long-term potentiation, and it strengthens that relationship. One of the things that's really going to generate the most powerful memories are heightened extreme emotions. Um, emotions like stress, depression, and joy, when in extreme amounts, really lead to powerful memory formation. So this is, again, why we have in the field of psychology a lot of doubt for any studies or any people claiming to have repressed memories. Because when it comes down to it, the information, it, a lot of this is going on in your limbic system. And memories are consolidated in a lot of the limbic system. They're stored in other areas, but they're processed and consolidated within the limbic system. In addition, emotions, specifically like those of fear and stress and worry, those are also going to be processed in the same neural regions. So the glucose is the driving factor behind what enables your brain to operate properly. So when neurons are active, they're going to use glucose. So if you've got one area that's essentially immersed in glucose, then all of those neurons are going to be pulling that glucose and using that. It's basically like putting a fat kid in a candy store. They're going to grab everything that they can. So if you've got processing of emotions running next to processing of memory, then you're going to get really powerful memories. One of the things that can and does disrupt this, however, is prolonged stress. So 
this is where it might be more plausible for people to um, forget certain things, is when they're under duress for an extended period of time, then there can be some disruption of memory. But for the most part, we like to believe uh, that repressed memories really aren't a thing. Now, in addition to everything we've talked about, and we've talked about a number of different memories, right? We've talked about sensory memories, we've talked about uh, short-term memory or working memory, we talked about long-term memory, and then in the past we also talked about, um, well, we talked about all the different types of sensory memory. Um, and there's another way of looking at memory. So there's, there's literally more, more ways to look at memory than there should be. But they all actually make sense in their own different way. So in addition to everything we've discussed, we can also look at explicit or implicit memory. And these are processed by two very different regions of the brain. And so you can actually have one form of memory loss while still having a perfectly strong memory in the other area. So explicit memory is what's known as declarative memory. It's your memory for facts, information, and it requires a conscious recall. It requires a decision to pull that information out of your brain. So when you're taking a test, you're using your declarative memory. This information is processed by the hippocampus. Implicit memory, on the other hand, is procedural memory. You don't need to think about pulling the information out because it occurs automatically. It's processed, for the most part, by the cerebellum. So this is how you swing a baseball bat. This is how you ride a bicycle. So these are your motor skills. And these are also going to be the conditioning effects. So these are things that don't require conscious focus to be able to recall the information. So let's look at some examples uh, specifically about what can happen when one area of the brain is damaged and the other is not. There's a famous study in psychology by a man, or about a man named H.M. H.M., uh, we call him H.M. because we don't reveal his true name. H.M. had his hippocampus removed. So if you remember, let's go back one slide, the hippocampus deals with this declarative memory, this factual memory. So if the hippocampus is removed, what do you think will happen to your ability to form new declarative memories? Exactly what you might expect. After losing the hippocampus, he was no longer able to make new memories. This form of amnesia, the amnesia where you cannot form new memories after a specific traumatic event, is known as anterograde amnesia. So prior to the surgery, HM's memory was fully intact. After that, he was unable to form new memories. This means that he's unable to know how old he is when he wakes up every day. This is essentially, if you've ever seen the movie Fifty First Dates, she had anterograde amnesia. She was able to remember all the information up to the moment when she suffered brain damage, and then she was no longer able to form new memories. So anterograde amnesia something that happens when you have damage to your hippocampus and it's severe enough to inhibit your ability to form new memories. Now, HM was a very sad case. It really was, uh, you know, the, the people that worked with him, you know, it was, it was a great opportunity to learn about the different types of memory, but it was certainly a very sad experience working with someone who was unable to form new memories. Uh, it was a necessary procedure, don't, don't get me wrong, it wasn't something that they did for shits and giggles. It was necessary, but sad nonetheless. But all was not lost for HM. While he couldn't form new declarative memories, he could still form new procedural or implicit memories. So, uh, you know, everybody probably had something like this when they were a kid. It's called the Tower of Hanoi. And it's a game, right, where you've got these, these stacks of uh, concentric rings, and the goal is to get them from point A to point B by moving them over and then moving them back over and keeping them within a tower. So they would bring HM into the room, and they would teach him how to play the, the Tower of Hanoi, 
and each time he would play, he had no memory that he had played the game before. But what they found was that the more often he played the game, and the more time that had passed since he first played the game, the quicker he was at completing the task. So what we see here is that while he wasn't able to remember the event, his physical memory, or his implicit memory, was able to remember the procedure of moving so that he was able to do it in a quicker fashion. So that is how procedural or implicit memory differs from explicit or declarative memory. So this information is um, this information is processed in the cerebellum. So his hippocampus was damaged, but his cerebellum remained intact. This is what enabled him to continue to form new procedural memories. Now, if you remember the lecture way back at the beginning where we looked at the brain, you'll remember that the cerebellum is largely um, part, it is part of that brain stem almost. So this is the spinal cord, and right, it goes up into the, the cerebellum is right behind a lot of this information right up here. So this is the early part of the brain. This is one of the earlier formations within the brain. So it makes sense then that it would be associated with procedural memory. Declarative memory is less important for, say, a rabbit. A rabbit doesn't really need to bring out information about mathematical equations all that often, right? But they do need to remember which direction to run, or how to run, rather, how to run away. So that information is processed in the earlier part of the brain, the lower, more basic part of the brain, which is that cerebellum. The declarative, or higher level memories, are heavily affected by the hippocampus. So that's it for today's lecture. Uh, next time we're going to talk about pulling that information out of the brain, which is the final stage of memory formation and retention. So thanks for sticking around with me. See you guys next time. Have an excellent day.